Jared is, is ready and rearing. So without further ado, I will give you Janie Winchell, who is not only the vice president of the Essex County Ornithological Club, but she is the Sarah Fraser Robbins director of the Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center at the Peabody Essex Museum. I just love saying that. It's been a while. <laughs> All right, Janie, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, well, and good evening, everyone. I don't know about you, but I am hearing the wind howling outside. And when I last checked the thermometer, it was down to three degrees. So um, it's a good time to be visiting uh, virtually the other side of the world. Um, as Jim said, I'm Janie Winchell, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome and introduce tonight's speaker, Jared Kies, who is returning to us uh, from when he was here in 2020 and did a talk about birding Southeast Arizona. And tonight he returns to tell us about another birding hotspot, Taiwan, where he has been traveling to over the, fat, the past four decades. Jared spent a year abroad in Taiwan studying Mandarin Chinese while attending Harvard University. And he has been returning there and birding there ever since. A Massachusetts native, Jared is an avid and lifelong birder and operates an educational bird gallery on Facebook and Instagram with over 200,000 followers. He posts content concurrently in Portuguese, Spanish, and English with the goal of linking the peoples of the Americas through their shared birds, love of birds. And I love that you do this. Jared is on the board of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies and serves on Massachusetts Audubon's advisory board. He is also a member of the ECOC and leads field trips for the club. So Jared, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I know I speak for the whole club in giving you a warm welcome. And I believe you are joining us from uh, California. Is that correct? Uh, if I were talking to you yesterday, that would be true, but I'm back in Massachusetts. Oh, you have you actually yeah. flew back in. <laughs> Just to be here on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're delighted to have you. Uh, you got here just in time for the extreme weather event, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks for being here. Great. I will share my screen and get us going. All right. Is that working? That's the question. Yep. Perfect. Um, looking good? Excellent. So great. Well, listen, it's really terrific to be back with everyone. Uh, thank you, Janie, and thank you, Jim, for entrusting me with this precious hour of, of the member's time. Uh, even though it's almost been two months after his presentation to the ECOC, I'm still thinking to myself, man, Doug Tallamy is a hard act to follow. That presentation he did on oak trees was fantastic, and I'm still talking about it with, uh, with friends. So I do recognize keenly how high the ECOC sets its bar for content, and I'm going to do my level best tonight not to drag down the bell curve. Uh, so before I get going, I wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, the first is that I would love to put in a plug for spring birding on Cape Ann. It's not just because I hope once again to lead walks there for the ECOC, uh, but I think that most birders associate Cape Ann with the cold weather, sea birding, uh, standing freezing on Andrews Point or Cathedral Ledge or wherever. But I think that those of you who have joined me or others uh, at Magnolia Woods or Dykes Pasture or Goose Cove, you know that Cape Ann is a wonderful coastal trap for neotropical migrants. And I encourage all, encourage all of you to discover this too. So if you really want to get a good look at a morning warbler in Dogtown, and yes, Janie, uh, I did finally figure out where it was hiding, uh, come on down in May. Uh, I also want to do, do a shout out to Zeno Canto, which is the crowdsourced bird sound database that's run out of the Netherlands. It has every bird on the planet, all kinds of calls. And uh, for this presentation, I relied on the work of a, uh, of a few individual recordists in particular because of the quality and consistency of their work. 
so as is required under the Zeno Canto Usage Agreement, I'd like to cite Jerome Ko, Sunny Tsung, and Chuck Hung for their contributions to today's presentation. All right, well, listen, over the next 45, 50 minutes, we will be far from Cape Ann and the North Shore. And my plan is to share with you all my experience communing with birds in one of my favorite places, uh, places which is Taiwan, also known as the island of Formosa. So what then you ask is my connection to Asia? Well, as Jenny said, I, I uh, uh, did major in, in uh, Mandarin in college. I intended to get into ornithology, but had this frighteningly close encounter with organic chemistry. And out of nowhere, and thank goodness in the nick of time, I found Mandarin. Uh, I ended up uh, at the Middlebury Language School in the, in the summer of, uh, of 1981 and ended up doing a year abroad at Donghai uh, University in Taiwan. Now, back in the 70s and early 80s, if you wanted to study Mandarin, uh, you really had a decision for it. You either went to mainland China, lived in a dorm with all foreigners, uh, and got followed around by a, by a Chinese communist handler, or he went to Taiwan and lived in a roommate with five Chinese uh, drinking and living uh, freely uh, in Chinese every hour of the day. Well, you can imagine uh, what choice I made. Um, so I've been back eight or nine times um, and uh, we'll be going back uh, uh, in just a few weeks. Um, so listen, let's talk about the independent island nation of Taiwan. And I'll comment first that I don't intend to get into the political situation in the Taiwan Straits. In a lot of ways, the tensions between the US and China uh, over Taiwan is sort of tonight's elephant in the room. And I suspect that some of you are wondering if you would dare go there at all right now. Well, all I can tell you is that I fully intend to keep visiting and I'll be there in, as I said, less than three weeks and I'll be there for an entire month. Uh, so I guess the question is, am I sticking my head in the sand? Uh, well, I certainly uh, hope not. Um, so Taiwan is an island, uh, 14,000 square mile island located 100 miles off the coast of China's Fujian province. It has a population of 23 million. And in addition to the main island, Taiwan also controls several outlining islands, including Jinmen, which is, which is written as Kinmen here on the map, which is embedded right in coastal China. Uh, it's an, a Kinmen is an extraordinary place to bird watch while in Taiwan, but the birds there would constitute an entirely separate presentation because what you get there is a mainland Chinese birding experience. So we will focus on the main island, uh, which is 85 miles uh, wide uh, at its broadest and 210 miles long with that extra 25 mile long nub at the base. I, I sort of like to think of it as a vestigial tail. Um, but thinking about it in, in terms of local ECOC geography, Taiwan would fit neatly within the borders of New England ex Maine. In other words, you could drop the island into New England and it will extend from the Canadian border of Vermont's Northeast Kingdom down to just south of Hartford with that vestigial nub tucking right up against Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. At the widest point, the island's center would come to about 15 miles of both New York State in the west and then uh, Maine on the east. Uh, so uh, this is, it would fit comfortably in sort of like a size 11 foot in a size 12 shoe. But here's the biggest difference, not that there are a lot of differences, but an enormous difference between Vermont, uh, uh, New Hampshire and Taiwan is that Vermont has, and New Hampshire have 53 mountain peaks over 4,000 feet. Taiwan has an astonishing 268 peaks that are over 3,000 meters, which is nearly 10,000 feet. The highest peak, Jade Mountain, is just under 13,000 feet, like I think it's 12,099 feet, uh, which compares to Mount Washington's 6,300 feet. In fact, 70% of Taiwan's landmass is either mountains or foothills, meaning that the human density, those 23 million people in the lowlands, particularly in the western portion of the island, is really dramatic. Um, the geography is a result of incredibly active geological forces. 
Taiwan is what is, is at what is called a convergent boundary where the tectonic plates meet. In Taiwan's case, there's multiple plates, right? So you have the Philippine plate, which is driving northwest on the one hand, it's colliding with and overriding the European plate, but this Philippine plate is concurrently subducting under the Okinawa section of the Eurasian plate in this almost unimaginable contortion. Uh, the landmass in Taiwan is actually remnant terrains or islands of crust that are thrust upward and mashed together by this tectonic activity. Uh, the most obvious new terrain accretion is in red there, and it's, it's in the Hainan coastal range on the southwest side of the island. This is a beautiful, lush part of the island and combines scenic valleys filled with rice paddies right up against the mountains. And you can see it extends from Taidong to Hualien on the, on the east part of the island. Uh, the convergent zone creates a lot of surface geothermal activity and hot springs abound in not only the far north by Taipei, but also the far south around, around Taidong in what is known as the volcanic arc. But in addition to these geological layers and interacting with this really dramatic elevation gradient is the fact that the Tropic of Cancer runs directly through the heart of the island, meaning that Taiwan is at that demarcation point between tropical and subtropical designations. So as a reminder, for those of you who don't remember, the Tropic of Cancer is at 23.5 degrees north longitude. The Tropic of Capricorn is at 23.5 degrees south longitude. And these are the most northerly and southerly points where at the summer and winter solstice, the sun is directly overhead before shifting back to the equator. So Taiwan is at sort of two convergent zones. One is geologic and one is that subtropical versus, versus tropical demarcation. Uh, the island uh, hosts uh, nearly 4,000 species of vascular plants, of which some 600 alone are ferns. Uh, so you can imagine the implication of this diversity in flora is an ecosystem which is has really dynamic richness and variability. Taiwan is washed in these ocean currents that come from the equator and keep the southern part of the island very humid and, and with, within about 10 or 15 degrees of 71 degrees. Uh, not a ton of temperature variability. The summer monsoons uh, contribute to a ton of rain. It averages over 100 inches in the south, but really that's skewed to those that southeastern slopes, which get uh, about 200 inches a year. Now compare this to Taipei in the north, uh, where the temperatures ranges from a low of 50 degrees uh, in the winter to 95 degrees in the summer. And that's because the, the, it's much more impacted by the, by the uh, continental Asian uh, uh, weather patterns than, than is the South. Uh, but perhaps the most uh, amazing thing about birding in Taiwan is that you can start your day in a coastal IBA, sweating tropical heat, and several hours later, find yourself breathing crisp alpine air at altitude for lunch, surrounded by roving flocks of mountain songbirds. A few places in the world provide this kind of astonishing variability in such a small geographic package. So here's some visuals of the landscape, and we'll start on the coasts. These are the wetlands along the west coastal plain near the ocean. These birds happen to be uh, mostly great egrets and black-faced spoonbills. Uh, were we to come from the east uh, and approach the mountains, it would be a far more dramatic because the mountains essentially rise right out of the ocean along the tectonic convergent boundary. Uh, the roads from the east coast are carved from granite and there is nothing gradual about the ascent to the mountains. Uh, from the west, we climb the foothills. We initially follow broad, shallow waterways toward the mountain interior and we enter the eco region that covers most of Taiwan, and that is subtropical, sorry, subtropical evergreen forest. So I don't mean evergreen in the New England sense of conifers, but evergreen in the tropical sense of non-deciduous broadleaf trees. And deciduous means to fall off. So it's non-deciduous broadleaf trees with dense understory and ground cover. And, and here's an example of sort of the amazing fern diversity in the forest. 
Well, mountain streams like this are host to innumerable water-loving birds, including the brown dipper, which can you know, swim underwater like a cormorant and is only one of five dipper, dipper species that exist on the planet. Uh, this is the little forktail, which is an endemic species and just about the quietest bird in Taiwan. In fact, only recently did some sounds make it onto Zeno Canto. Um, its white legs are ghostly and delicate, and they're even whiter than those of the Swainson's warbler. And its brow is so upright and flat that it has this totally distinctive profile. Uh, Finally, one of the most common birds along the banks and the rocks uh, in the mountainous riparian habitats in Taiwan is this, what I think is just an exquisite plumbeous redstart. It has this high, lilting, ringing song that can be heard around mountain waterways across the island, even in the deepest rock canyons. And I'm going to play a very quick pretty, uh, video collage uh, that has representative shots of both the male and the female, and hopefully you can all hear this, uh, this song. So as we rise in elevation, the flora diversity essentially changes in similar concentric circles across the island, like the gradient lines on a topographic map, meaning you get similar flora at similar elevations, irrespective of the angle from which you, from the angle of attack from which you approach the central mountains. At lower elevations, the larger trees tend to be various forms of evergreen chestnuts and laurel. Uh, uh, and while there are some subtropical pines in these lower elevations, that's really broadly flora really prevails. Uh, the benefit of climbing, of course, is that you leave the densely populated basins and plains behind and rise above the smog into this wonderful crisp alpine air. Air quality can be a really desperate issue in Taiwan, uh, which has the dubious distinction of having the largest coal-powered electricity plant in the world, which is in fact not far uh, toward the coast from this picture. Uh, as we climb higher, deciduous hardwoods like alder and maple concur with hemlock, which is itself a transitional conifer species of the subapine uh, forest zone. Uh, this particular photo was actually taken on the backside of Ali Shan National Forest Recreation Area. And the great thing about this mountain road, and it's very well maintained, is that it drops down to this steep river valley that heads north through the heart of the island and eventually reaches one of the great scenic wonders of Taiwan, which is the Sun Moon Lake. Uh, and I really hope that all of you uh, eventually have the chance to, to see this. So all along the western approach to the mountains, there, there are a number of these fabulous valleys that dead head at national park recreation areas. Uh, this one is called Awanda and is one of my favorites. It's got cottages for rents, an amazing new suspension bridge, and is designed for bird watchers in mind with platforms and uh, amazing paths and trails. Uh, another such uh, area uh, at, the, has the, at a mountain valley further south is called Shanlin Shi, and the, the steep river valley uh, ends at this extraordinary cave with hundreds of nesting Asian house martins I still have yet to figure out how to take a good picture of a flying martin or swallow, so I don't keep a picture here of one of those. But um, So with deciduous trees like maples uh, comes leaf peeping, and Taiwan does have fall foliage to enjoy at elevation. And of course, the corollary to autumn foliage is spring bloom. And March in the Formosan Mountains is a complete and utter joy. This is Bashan National Park. It's the only place where I've ever been able to reliably observe one of my favorite mountain tits, the chestnut bellied tit, which is a paradise family member, which is grouped closely with the tit mice and chickadees. So at the highest, uh, at the highest forested uh, 
sorry about that, at the highest forested elevation are stands of sub subalpine conifer trees like spruce, firs, and more hemlock. Uh, in certain steep valleys, these mix with an astonishing array of hardwoods, including several members of the beech family, and there's lots of native rhododendron in the open understory. Uh, and like so many woodland paths in Taiwan, the trails are really well maintained. And if they do have steps, and, and if they don't have steps and are very steep, they'll generally have ropes installed uh, to provide a solid purchase. And finally, above the tree line, and this is not above the tree line, but I really wanted to share this because it reminds me of, uh, of uh, Prescott National Forest in Arizona or someplace in, in, uh, in California. But once you do get above uh, the tree line, you get this incredible treeless tundra environment that I first access off of Route for, uh, Highway 14, which before it was closed due to an earthquake in the eastern section, it actually crossed the island right near its midsection, a dramatic highway. Um, it crests at over 10,000 feet, and from the parking lot, you can get these various trails. And the day I took this photo, it was blown at absolute gale, and the snow was in the air. And this amazing bird was clinging to rocks and mosses and gleaning for insects. Uh, this is an alpine accentor. It's one of 19 members of the Prunellidae family, uh, of which are all in a single genus of old world alpine specialists. This bird, the alpine accentor, is so hardy that Everest climbers have actually reported seeing this bird at 26,000 feet. So bird watching and bird photography have exploded in popularity in Taiwan and represent really what is that tip of the spear for citizen scientists and naturalists to push for legislative protections of IBAs and other uh, habitats. Uh, eBird's Taiwan portal went live in 2015 after a bunch of years of development at Cornell to make sure that the content management system could handle Chinese characters. At total, at 823 total checklists, Taiwan ranks number seven in total checklists in the world as a country. And in the global big day of May 2022, May ranked, uh, Taiwan ranked number 45 in the number of species and number 18 in the number of uh, checklists submitted. Uh, this remarkable chart is was produced as part of the report on the state of birds in Taiwan in 2020. Uh, this was sponsored by the Taiwan Federal Forestry Bureau, uh, Bureau and uh, coordinated with, uh, with a bunch of different uh, academic institutions and conservation organizations. And at a glance, you can see what Taiwan has in store for you. First are the 29 endemics in the upper right corner there. Uh, these are sort of a holy grail for listers who are looking to grow their global lifeless I don't happen to be a lister, but um, but people go there and do crash weeks just to just to beef their lists up. But not only are there 20 endemic endemics, but there's also the endemic subspecies, which are poised in some number of decades or centuries to speciate as a result of their geographic uh, isolation in Taiwan. Uh, so ultimately, there's this potential. Uh, to have actually 84 endemics in Taiwan where these, uh, where these subspecies to finally actually be considered uh, full species. So, uh, so get ready, uh, go to Taiwan, get all 84, and before you know it, uh, you could just back your way into uh, 84 species. Another number I wanted to point out on this chart is the 91 transient uh, migrants in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Taiwan is strategically located on the East Asian Australasian flyway and a numerous species that breed in far eastern Russia and Japan pass across Taiwan on their way to the Malay archipelago. Uh, raptor watching is highly developed in Taiwan and like in Veracruz in Mexico, the southern tip of Taiwan is this geographic cho choke point where an estimated 300,000 migrating raptors stays before they make the jump uh, over the open ocean to the Philippines. Um, annual counts have been done uh, there over 20 years, and they've got uh, uh, some 25 species have been recorded uh, there. This map uh, shows the route taken by several tagged gray-faced buzzards, 
which clearly show the important uh, geographic role that Taiwan plays in, in migration. Uh, another group I wanted to, uh, of transients along the flyway is water birds. Even rarities like the spoon-billed sandpiper uh, had been seen in Taiwan uh, most recently in 2020. Uh, so much of wetland birding in Taiwan actually feels incredibly familiar because amongst all the quite unfamiliar uh, birds, there are many jarringly familiar old friends. Uh, in terms of waterfowl, uh, you get northern shovelers, green-winged teal, northern pintail, greater scop. Well, shorebirds are trickier because on the one hand, you're lured in with this warm sense of familiarity. There's the black crowned night heron, you've got great egrets, cattle egret, but then you are just bonked on the head with astonishment at the new and sometimes exotic. So this photo is a classic Taiwan shorebird moment. Uh, you look out on the mud flats with your scope and you exclaim with astonishment, Dunlin, check it out, those are Dunlin. And of course you would be exactly right. But as soon as you're feeling at home, you notice this sacred ibid in the ibis in the background, and you realize you're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, you also try to make sense of that medium-sized shorebird on the right, and you're thinking, well, maybe it's a greater yellow legs or a willet, and, and but the legs have you puzzled. But luckily for you, you learn that those red legs make it the most common, straightforward ID of all the willet-sized uh, shorebirds in Taiwan. It is a common red shank. Uh, for me, in the beginning, shorebirding in Taiwan was this constant tug of war between the uplift of recognition and then the letdown of, of realizing that it, you've done something completely wrong and you actually have no idea what the bird is. So here's a sample of what I mean. It's like, oh, look, Ma, a great blue heron. Sorry, it's a great, it's a gray heron. I note the gray pantaloons, the pure black on the shoulders, the light gray neck. Uh, or Oh, oh, that, that bird's bobbing its tail. It has got to be a spotted sandpiper. Yeah, sorry again, it's a common sandpiper. No yellowish or orange on the bill. Or this one, it has to be a snowy plover, right? Yeah, sorry, it's a Kentish plover. But of course, you will have done all your homework before you go to Taiwan and you will know by geography, by geography alone that this is a golden plover, that this is a pied avocet, and this is a black winged stilt. Of course, you can't talk about Taiwan shorebirds without mentioning this wonderful creature. Uh, this is a black-faced spoonbill. There are six species of spoonbill found across the globe on every continent except Antarctica. The black-faced spoonbill is by far the most endangered, and, but over half the worldwide population of only 4,500 individuals winter in Taiwan. And most of those are found either in the Zhengwen River Sanctuary or the Algu wetlands along the southwest coast. The bonus you get in viewing these extraordinary creatures in Taiwan is sometimes you were afforded a twofer, as I was here with the Eurasian spoonbill, which as you can see has a, has a white face versus the black-faced uh, spoonbill. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, mudflat and wetland reclamation has devastated uh, shorebird numbers. Taiwan is no exception. And between 95 and 2015, Taiwan lost over 11,000 acres of mudflat and wetland habitat to development. That said, the kind of awareness that is growing through citizen scientists and eBird uh, is, is bringing a lot of pressure on, uh, uh, for protection of these types of habitats. So let's leave the West Coastal Plain uh, behind and head east uh, to some inland birds. So my general idea for our itinerary is to start in the subtropical lowlands at a couple of hundred feet above sea level and gradually penetrate the central mountain chain. Uh, this will be a generalized trip combining a couple of different routes, but all of them start at the West Central Lowland Plain and ascend to a high point of eight or 9,000 feet where we will meet our final birds. So the challenge here is that everything is new. Uh, even the lowly house sparrow is new because it is not a house sparrow at all. It is a Eurasian, a Eurasian tree sparrow. Uh, so I'm just gonna focus on those birds that I particularly love and find interesting, but I'm gonna blast through some initial birds 
uh, before we do some, uh, some deeper dives. So here are some commonly uh, observed creatures uh, that you will see with some, uh, with some frequency. So this is a black drongo. Uh, it is super aggressive. In India, it's called the policeman bird because it provides protection from predators for other birds nesting in its trees or general uh, breeding areas. Uh, the gray tree pie. Uh, this is a ruckus bird. It's only one of a handful of uh, uh, corvidae species in Taiwan. Uh, common kingfisher, if there are reeds or rushes or branches above still water, there will be a common kingfisher. Uh, same with this uh, wonderful bird, the Eurasian moorhen. I took this picture in the Taipei Botanical Gardens. Little grebe, super common across the entire old world, but completely adorable. Why in the world does Cornell describe it as small and dumpy? I don't know. Uh, so this is the great chinned minivet. It's the sole member of the cuckoo shrike family that uh, is found regularly in Taiwan. Why they focused on the gray chin, it seems to me there's some other colors that could have uh, been used in its name. Uh, brown shrike, it's only one of two shrikes that you're commonly found uh, in Taiwan. Uh, the chestnut-tailed starling, this beautiful blue lower bill, uh, it forces you to rethink all those uncharitable thoughts that you have about starlings. Uh, the Taiwan blue magpie, this is uh, one of the sort of uh, mascots, iconic mascots of Taiwan, uh, and it moves around in these great ruckus groups, and when it finds fresh fruit, it is all over it. Uh, Japanese white eye, uh, uh, this is an, an amazing clade of 142 very similar species that are amongst the most rapidly uh, speciating verte uh, vertebrate lineages on the planet. Uh, this is the light vented bulbul. It's an, it's an endemic subspecies and it ranks among the most common birds you'll see in Taiwan. It's like, it's like the robin there. Uh, as is the black bulbul, uh, which is plentiful from Africa all the way to Southeast Asia and Japan. And it has its own taxonomic family of 151 birds and that family is called the Pycnonidae. All right, let's slow down a touch. So while we're in the low elevations, let's uh, start our deeper dive with the Prinias. So I have loved uh, these birds since the first time I saw them back in 1981, uh, because they have this incredibly appealing, what I would say is an uncombed devil may care look. Uh, these three Prinias can be seen, uh, uh, all be seen in Taiwan. That's the striated, the plain, and the more common yellow bellied. Uh, these are members of a large family of 161 birds called cysticolas that stretch all the way from Spain uh, and Western Africa all the way to Australia. Uh, as seen in my photographs, these are fine bill, they have long graduated tails, but don't be fooled, these are actually very small birds and the plain prinia in the lower left is barely five inches long and weighs only about a quarter of an ounce. And although you may not see it every time you're around the wetlands, if there are reeds and dense vegetation along small waterways, you will invariably hear the song of the yellow belly prinia. It's a beautiful song, so let me play it. You just hear that all the time, guys. It's just, a, it, you just know what you're hearing when you hear it. Okay. Uh, the next lowland bird I'd like to, you to meet is the black-naped monarch, just a stunning bird. Uh, I missed this for years uh, before I finally got a glimpse of it, and now I see them regularly, including in Taipei City Parks. Uh, this is only one of the 100-member monarch uh, flycatcher family that resides in Taiwan, and it is considered an endemic subspecies. There are two paradise flycatchers in the same taxonomic family that pass through the island seasonally, but the black mate monarch is the resident uh, bird. Uh, this flycatcher occurs across Asia, deep into Asia, and it uh, uh, breeds at really rel high elevations in the Himalayas. Uh, it has an absolutely spectacular uh, sound. Not that part of the sound. You hear it at a great distance. 
Uh, one of the iconic endemic birds of Taiwan is the Taiwan barbet, uh, whose Chinese name is, for obvious reasons, the five color bird. It actually has two names in Chinese. The other one is uh, Ning Zhuo Mu, which means the uh, woodpecker imposter, because it actually lives uh, in old uh, woodpecker holes. Uh, it's one of 34 species of Asian barbets in the Megalamidae family, and almost all of them have this sort of uh, very highly uniform color scheme, and they have this cuckoo-like whistled song that really sets the basic soundtrack of forests in Asia and Southeast Asia. So if you're in Zeno Canto listening to songs of birds at lower elevations in Taiwan, usually in the background you hear this bird. Okay, of the 22 parrot bills that are found in China and Southeast Asia, two are found in Taiwan, and both are endemic subspecies. The Venus-throated parrot bill is the lowland specialist, and although it's listed as common, uh, I have found it anything but common, and I was delighted when this one finally cooperated with my camera. Uh, it's always seemed to me to have this wide-eyed, childlike appearance. The last, uh, the last lowland bird I want to share with you is the black naped oriole, which is one of 38 species of old world orioles. And along with the maroon oriole is only two such birds that we're going to find in Taiwan. Its voice has just unmistakable rich oriole texture. Uh, and even though this oriole is hefty 11 inches and it's kind of a bruiser, it's one of those birds that seeks refuge in the nesting ter territory of the black drongo. That we uh, that we met earlier. Just a buttery sound. All right, let's start climbing, and we'll stop at Awanda's bird observation platform at about thirty-five hundred feet. Uh, here is where we start to get uh, dense mixed flocks of the mountain birds. And one of the, this uh, flock's core charter members is one of the most common passerines in Taiwan. It's the adorable and well-coiffed Morrison's fulvetta. Uh, this bird was awarded full endemic species quite recently when it was broken off from the larger gray-cheeked fulvetta group, which spans from China and Nepal all through the mountains. Its voice is completely unique and it ranks among my favorite songs in Taiwan. Its voice is an essential part of the forest soundtrack in Taiwan. Whoops, come on now, let's make sure this song comes out. Nope. Really unique, right? All right, this next flocking bird is a white-bellied air pornis. Uh, it's grouped in the Veronidae family along with the Vireos and the Greenlets of the New World, but it has the distinction of being the only bird on the planet called an air pornis. I have no idea what air pornis means, and I've tried to figure it out. And if any of you can find out what the derivation of that word is, I would be much obliged. Uh, by the way, this bird, like many of the flocking mountain birds in Taiwan, is unstoppably frenetic. And it took me years before I got a, uh, a publishable quality photo. All right, although it doesn't flock with the smaller birds, the, the vivid Niltava 
is a key presence at mid elevations and it's one of the great gifts to bird watchers. There are six Niltavas in the genus and all are found in Southeast Asia and Southern China. Uh, I've yet to get what I consider sort of the definitive set of photographs of this endemic subspecies in Taiwan, but I want you guys to see and hear it because its voice is so smooth, appealing and, and distinctive. All right, some of the most extraordinary birds in Taiwan, and actually fully nine of the 29 endemics are all from the Leothicridae family of 143 laughing thrushes and allies. At this elevation, the star of this group is the steers Leocicla, uh, the bird that I consider the most unusually colored bird in Taiwan, where its name is the yellow mold for that mole-like uh, beauty spot in front of its eye. Uh, the steers Leocicla sings almost constantly and is in that minority of bird species that regularly sings a duet with its mate. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of like the, uh, the, the, uh, the Northern Cardinal in that way. Uh, the singing receives a ton of research in Taiwan and the pair's language is incredibly complicated and plays a, a real uh, important role uh, in the strengthening of their pair bonds. <laughs> All right, uh, let's shift uh, north toward Great Snow Mountain and drive up the top section of the mountain road. So we're leaving the broadleaf forest behind and entering the subalpine mixed deciduous and evergreen woodlands. Uh, the Snow Mountain Road is 49 kilometers long from the urban basin at the bottom and ends at a visitor center. Uh, the 35, at 35 kilometers, at that marker, you pass through the ticket booth to the National Park and you can stop and use the facilities. Now, I do not normally feature restrooms in my presentations, however, the men's room at 35 kilometers up the road is essentially a bird blind and I've gotten some great sightings while multitasking. And sorry, ladies, I've not been into the ladies' room. I have no idea whether it has as good a view. Um, but as the, uh, uh, the road up has these pull-offs and bird observation platforms that make for some of the great birding in Taiwan because you're basically at eye level with the forest canopy. So on the way up, we pass a couple of old growth trees uh, and that one on the right is called a shanmu, which is uh, basically the sort of the god tree that is apparently over 2,500 years old based on uh, cores they've taken. At 43 kilometers, there's an inn with these beautiful uh, wooden cottages and a fantastic cafeteria, which is one of my favorite places to stay. Uh, once at elevation, we encounter the strangest bird in Taiwan, the endemic Taiwan cupwing. Uh, there's five cup wings found in the high mountains in Asia, and they occupy their own taxonomic family, the Nopigenae, the, sorry, the Nopigenae, uh, uh, again, with only five birds in it. Uh, these birds are virtually tailless and act more like rodents than birds because they spend most of their lives walking on terra firma under the dense ground cover. They do fly in these short bursts when under duress, but they do seem on this trajectory toward flightlessness. Uh, the experience of trying to get a visual on this bird really reminds me of trying to track black rail in Anahuac. Uh, I have been within two or three feet of a calling black rail, but it was so buried in lower levels of these sedge grasses that I never got a visual. Same thing happens uh, with the coupling in Taiwan. Uh, but here's, here's its song. like a little squeaking wheel. In, uh, in Taiwan, the, the nickname of this bird is called the tea egg because literally it is the size of those boiled eggs that they boil in soy sauce. And, uh, and it, might as well be a, it might as well be a little egg. Uh, 
So there's two endemics here in the mountains that drive me totally batty, because even though they could not be more different physically or taxonomically, their songs are tantalizingly similar, and I find myself bamboozled by them in the field. Uh, the first of this vexing pair is the elegant white-eared sibia, which is one of six sibias found in the mountains from Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar to southern China. This is a real canopy bird, so viewing it from the mountain road uh, on Snow Mountain is really the way you want to go. Almost like a cat call. So the other vexing songster is this titmouse-esque uh, Taiwan Yuhina. Uh, it and its six Yuhina uh, genus cousins cover the exact same mountain territory in Asia as the Sibias. So whether or not uh, this is why they have similar songs, I don't know. But, uh, but anyways, take a listen and see if you think this is at all similar to the Sibia. Nice rich whistle. All right, we already met the chestnut uh, uh, th of this one. This is the tiniest bird in Taiwan. It comes in under five grams and it's the rufous faced warbler. Its song is this steady ring and it's so ubiquitous at elevation that just as the, as the barbette is in the background of many lowland recordings, this bird is almost always in the background of, uh, of, of high elevation birds. And it took me a number of years to get, uh, to get close enough, uh, and this bird's still enough to actually get a photograph. But here's its song. Almost insect-like. I think your telephone was going off or something. All right, we already met the chestnut belly tit at, in Bashia National Park, but now we're going to meet with a bird that ranks, I think, is it's in the running for the cutest bird ever, and that's the black throated tit. It's one of 11 birds in the long tailed tit family, Agathalidae. Uh, it is impossible to get photographs of this bird by following it to a perch. You have to anticipate where it's going to land and then just cross your fingers. <laughs> so one of the many joys of birding in Yunnan province in far southern China along the border of Myanmar and Vietnam are what I would term the true laughing thrushes of what is that now familiar Leothricidae family, the Sibias um, uh, and the Leocicla. Uh, these are hefty robin-sized birds that come in all manner of colors and appear in all manner of habitats. Uh, Taiwan has its own handful of laughing thrushes, and a primary one at elevation is the, endem is the endemic quite whiskered laughing thrush. So when you first uh, see this one, this fellow, you think, well, that's a cool chocolate bird, and wow, I really love that voice. And then the bird shifts position on its perch, and you think, ooh, maybe there's a surprise inside. And finally, you get a look at its back, and you think, uh, wow, that is, uh, that is some kind of bird. And it really is, and that green in its wing uh, that's only found in the Leothicridae family of birds, and it's just like the, the steers Leocicla we saw before. All right, another remarkable laughing thrush that's found in Taiwan is the rufous crowned, um, and it ranks, for me, among my favorite birds on the island. It also happens to be one of those nine Leothicridae endemics found on the island. So the rufous crowned uh, is a mountain wanderer of the first order, and all the times I've been to the high elevation of Taiwan, I've only seen this species one single time. Uh, and as, 
And, and it was as they always are, the birds were in a large family flock calling to each other, staying closely connected, um, including physically, occasionally sitting together and simply cuddling. Uh, and as you'll see in this short clip, this bird is one of the most affectionate birds you would ever want to meet and so fluffy that uh, really all you want to do is give it a hug. And that, that pose is just classic Rufus Crown uh, laughing thrush, just a loving bird. They're always cuddling, just could not be, uh, could not be more, uh, could not be more adorable. All right. Let's see if I can keep the, here we go. All right. So uh, bar wings are close relatives of the laughing thrushes and the sibias, which all reside in the same taxonomic family. Uh, the Taiwan barwing is one of the prized endemic species for bird watchers, and it is listed as uncommon in the bird guides. Uh, and that is something with which I completely, uh, completely agree. Um, I was in Taiwan numerous times before I happened to bump into this one as I stepped out of a, of a hostel uh, way up high in the mountains and happened to have my camera, uh, happened to have my camera with me. So whenever we folk of the ECOC hear the word warbler, something strange begins to happen. We get this warm feeling all over, our skin tingles, and we involuntary, involuntarily smile. Is everyone smiling? Uh, visions of Blackburnian, uh, Blackburnians and black-throated blues dance in our heads. Uh, but when it comes to old world warblers, uh, the world gets turned completely on its head. So you might think that this is some long lost chart of confusing fall warblers from Roger Torrey Peterson, when in fact it is a small sampling, and I mean a small sampling of old world warblers in full adult plumage. Now, warbler watching in Asia is like picking through some disconcerting amalgamation of a fall Tennessee, a fall black pole warbler topped off with a, with a smattering of warbling vireo. Uh, well, there are a couple of resident warblers in Taiwan I wanted you to. I wanted to play you guys the song of the yellowish-bellied bush warbler. Uh, you think they could get do better than yellowish uh, belly, but anyways, this is a high elevation specialist, and I got this photo in Tata Jia, which is near the crest of the road up Alishan National Park to the south. So this warbler has the most extraordinary song of any bird in Taiwan and maybe the world. Uh, its vocalization lasts nearly 45 seconds. And to put that in perspective, even the winter wren, which seems to sing endlessly, only produces phrases of about six seconds. So the yellow bellied starts at around the second E above middle C and climbs in a perfect chromatic scale as many as 22 steps before throwing in the towel and transitioning to this extended raspberry. Uh, so let's see if this song registers through the speakers. Now it starts to speed up. Now tell me that isn't some kind of song. And the amazing thing is, even though the pitch is so high, it hits every little chromatic step uh, just perfectly. I just think it's an astonishing feat of bird song. Okay, so within the, the vast uh, Fringillidae family of finches and grosbeaks, there are 27 species of Carpodacus rose finches. And a number of, number of them are virtually interchangeable. And in Yunnan province in Southern China, I found these birds, particularly the females, to be hopelessly indistinguishable. 
I still have photographs of female rose finches that I took in Yunnan that I have not yet classified. Uh, luckily in Taiwan, there's only one, and it's a distinctly lovely bird, the Taiwan rose finch. And uh, just because it's so eye-catching does not mean it's easy to find. Uh, in fact, all the times I've been in Taiwan, only once did uh, one set up for, uh, uh, for a reasonable photograph. Pretty fancy song, huh? Another member of the finch and grosbeak family here in the mountains is the endemic subspecies, the brown bullfinch. Why it's not called the gray bullfinch, I don't know, but it's the brown bullfinch. And for me, this is the real will-o'-the-wisp bird on the order of a crossbill here. Uh, these birds occur uh, west through the Himalayas, and in Taiwan it moves in these flocks all around the central mountain chain looking for perfect seeds. Uh, this is a bird that I rarely encounter, and to do so on a bluebird day at elevation was amazing. And during this, this little collage, note the luscious sheen to the folded wing feathers and the tiny touch of red at the center of its back at the innermost tertials. All right, at about marker 41K on Snow Mountain Road, you come upon this horde of bird photographers all sitting in folding canvas stools along the sides of the road. Each has a lens bigger than the next, these true howitzers, and they're all waiting for this most remarkable creature to emerge from the forest to pick away at seeds that are set out at certain times of day. And this is the Mikado pheasant. It's one of the most magnificent wild, flower, wild fowl on the planet, and it's endemic to Taiwan. This bird is now so inured to the photo photographers that all you have to do is click the camera at the right time of day, and out comes the bird for dinner. It's like Pavlov's bird. Uh, when it gets its fill, it walks regally into the forest, ambling with ease on these incredibly steep, frighteningly steep terrain, as if it were a pedestrian on Fifth Ave and within a few yards just is swallowed up by the forest uh, until its next meal. All right, the final three birds I want you to meet are all old world flycatchers. Um, so uh, they, uh, Asia may not have uh, new world warblers, but they got flycatchers. And the first is an endemic subspecies, and it operates at the highest elevations of any flycatcher in the world, breeding as high as 14,000 feet in the Himalayas. Uh, its name is the white-browed bush robin, and its favorite nesting habitat is wet rhododendron undergrowth. And it seems to me that this bird defines what it means to be golden. Uh, look at that throat. It is just as if it were gold leaf laid on uh, by an artist. All right, the next flycatcher is, is in the same Tarsiga genus as the white browed, but it is one of Taiwan's full endemic species, the collared bush robin. This is an abundant bird at mid and high elevations, but always is so striking that I just can't take my eyes off it. Uh, I'd never get bored of seeing it. Uh, these flycatchers are strong, are subject to strong uh, sexual dimorphism, as you can see in this photograph. Okay guys, the final bird that I want you to meet today is the white-tailed robin. And this is by far the most flexible flycatcher of the three in terms of habitat. And, and although I took this photograph at over 8,000 feet, this bird during winter descends below 1,000 feet and is just as happy in wet broadleaf forest and river valley bottoms as it is in mixed uh, deciduous coniferous forest at elevation. 
when I sleep at elevation, this bird is generally the first one that greets me in the morning, and sometimes so early that you think its clock is completely out of whack. Uh, its voice is a quavering warble, and to my ears, it is very reminiscent of either the viri or the hermit thrush, or perhaps a mixture. In fact, if I play a hermit thrush in the, in the forest, this bird will often call back. What do you guys think? All right, guys, there's a lot more I could I could share with you guys, but um, but I think we'll we'll stop there. I will. All right. Incredible. Thank you all for your uh, patience. And I really hope you guys get to Taiwan someday, you know, to be able to go from the coast to 10,000 feet in a matter of a few hours. Uh, there is really nothing like it in the in the world. Really special place. And the people are so friendly. It's incredibly safe. You can be outside at any time of night in any part of the city or the countryside. Uh, I've never felt, felt safer than I do in, in Taiwan. How many times have you been there now, Jared? I think this trip will be, will be, will be nine, I think. I'm not sure. Um, you know, we re I really started uh, birding in earnest there uh, uh, after retiring in 2017 and, uh, and generally travel with a guide uh, and that guy doesn't speak English. So I really had to learn all the birds in Chinese. So this is the only time I'm ever referring to them by their English names. Um, and, uh, and so I really sort of, uh, I'm, it's fun speaking to them in their native tongue, which of course is Chinese. <laughs> right, right. That's impressive that you, you can stay on top of, of both names uh, for all these species. <laughs> it's like, it, is, it is a bunch of work, but um, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, they the community there of birders is really, is really rich. There's a lot of people love birds there. And, and although you see a lot of people taking pictures and they literally don't know what birds they're seeing, there's a lot of good birders in Taiwan and they've got a beautiful, uh, bird guide called the birds of Taiwan, which, uh, has been now in English for several years, uh, and is just a terrific, terrific guide. Um, so in terms of traveling there, uh, I'm interested that you're undeterred despite the tensions. And, and so what kind of, at what point would you not travel there? Because I, I, you must be monitoring it closely yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, uh, I mean, remember that the, the early uh, depiction I showed of the island and the, and the smaller islands that were embedded in the coast. If anything's going to happen, those are going first because they might they just go up, you know, a quarter mile, and there's they're on they're on these islands, um, and the the military has been very reduced by Taiwan in those places. So, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I you know people say 2027, 28. I don't, I don't know, but uh, it would be an awful big job for uh, for China to try to take that entire island. I mean, it would you know it would be a blockade. There'd be a blockade would start, uh, and it's, I don't think it, there's just going to be a raining down of uh, of missiles. It would be a, it would be something like that, um, uh, which would be very sad because Taiwan is a wonderful, peaceful, democratic place, um, and uh, with with all the freedoms that you'd you'd want to see in in any country. Uh, so yeah. So for now, you're you're still planning on. On, on this year and and yeah. and years to come. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's encouraging, definitely, because it looks absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, and and a lot of uh, the just the attention to the um, engagement with the landscape. So the the walkways were so beautiful, and I imagine that you know we're just getting a, a hint of the. Of, of the appreciation that's expressed through uh, the pathways and the architecture that you were you were encountering there in the you know especially out in the forested areas. 
Yeah, no, there's, you know, when I was there um, in school in, in 81, 82, uh, you know, there really wasn't that attention. You know, there was a lot of trash in national parks, but I tell you, you go back now and the place is pristine. Um, mm -hmm. the, the public transportation is excellent. Um, they've got high-speed trains now. You can get around really easily. And, you know, English is spoken really widely. Uh, we really struggled in Japan because uh, even though we could read the signs because they're in, in Chinese characters, people just don't speak English in ways that, that is really helpful. And, but in Taiwan, you can, you can get around. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a really easy place to travel. And I just want to mention um, for people, please feel free to put uh, questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, there's one here, and I apologize if I'm Mikael uh, Larkins asks, how do you find a guide in Asia and what should one think about in choosing someone? I'm going to Japan in May and I'm looking for guides. This presentation was so amazing. Maybe I can do a side trip to Taiwan. So you've inspired, <laughs> you've inspired one of our, our guests tonight. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, I, for, for, for the U.S., I've, I've done a lot of birding pal stuff and, you know, someone who just wants to show you around, that's great. But, you know, if you, if you just Google, and I did this afternoon, uh, bird guides in Taiwan, you know, even tropical birding, which, of course, mans the station at, at High Island um, and does all those local trips, they have a trip, they have a, you know, a 10-day to 14-day trip in Taiwan. Uh, so it's being done by by the even the, the really high level uh, guides are, are 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 working that that area now. So it's easy to find a guide. Uh, I happen to glom on through someone who who ran their eco diversity uh, uh, department in the government to link into this to this guide and her husband who's also a, a naturalist and. Uh, and I actually have the first one I was the trip I was on with these two. I had three photographers, including an expat, American expat, who were all from uh, from Singapore. And I basically had to act as the as the interpreter for them because uh, because she wasn't she didn't speak uh, she didn't speak English almost at all. Um, but I wasn't taking photographs at that time. But to experience being a a pure bird watcher helping photographers find birds in Taiwan was really was really interesting inspired me to get into photography at all actually um, but you can find guides easily really easily and I can give if people want to reach out to me directly and you know want the kind of how to get in touch with like Chuck Hung who's was one of the recorders there He's, I've seen him I bumped him any number of times and he has groups that are delighted with his service uh, Jared well, uh, Jared, uh, Marilyn uh, in the chat asked uh, whether we can look forward to any of uh, to you leading any walks this spring for the ECOC. Uh, do you have any specific plans? Uh, well, as soon as I think the schedule starts, I'd love to do all the ones that I've done in in the past, and you know, a couple in. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, I will. I will. I will endeavor. I'm in. I'm in in the area from April and May, and will absolutely love to do some uh, group trips in in Cape Ann. Absolutely, that's right. excellent news. You you do an amazing walk and uh, and bring incredible enthusiasm as well as knowledge uh, on those walks. So thank you for that. Um, and. Uh, I was curious, how many species have you seen there? Do you have a rough count at this point? You know, um, I suppose that if I went to my eBird quickly, I could probably tell you in, in very short order what I've seen there. I really don't, I really don't at the top of my, up top of my head no, but I can change the region to Taiwan as we as we speak, and I can tell you exactly. Taiwan, I've seen 217 species, and so normally when you go to Taiwan, you know, you, you, the the guides would tell you to to anticipate seeing 220 birds, because a lot of the 650 they list, these are real rarities that pop in from you know that that stop over or stop in from mainland. Um, so, you know, 220, that's a pretty standard uh, number that I've got now. 
That's excellent. And also, I tend to go during the shoulder seasons because the summer for me is too hot. And and so I'm not I'm not seeing the dead winter birds. I'm not seeing the birds that are there in the summer. I'm really only getting uh, those shoulder season birds. So I'm always going to be limited uh, in terms of the species I'm going to see. Right. So a lot of the birds you were showing us are ones that many of them are are birds that people could realistically see while they're there. 100 percent. And I'd always recommend going in that sort of March. Uh, uh, April, October, November time frame because the the weather's great and and uh, um, uh, it's just a it, temperature wise it's a great time to be there. Incredible. Um, and I loved all the the recordings you included. Um, that really just brought those birds to life in in such a dramatic way as well. So thank you for all that because that's I know a whole nother level of of effort to pull together, but it adds. Well, my pleasure. Well, in my galleries, I, I, you know, I'm doing these video collage clips, so I'm sort of used to know getting onto Xenocanto. What are the good recorders? I go right to their work and and pull it up. So uh, if you do it enough, that you finally, and Xenocanto is just so great to have that as a as a as a resource. It's been fantastic for uh, for for my work. Well, it's great to know about. Um. Uh, and any other questions that people might have, um, this is a good time to bring them forward. Oh, it looks like maybe there's another in the Q and A. No, that was that's the one we already did. Yeah, and and we're all we're all ECOC members. Anyone have any questions? Uh, do not uh, hesitate I, to I, just to lob me a call or a text or anything. I have not a question, but an observation. Uh, when you were playing the white-eared sibia and the other one that sounded quite like it, yeah. Uh, I'd have sworn the white-eared sibia was saying white, white, white ear. Uh, and, uh, and the other one wasn't quite as convincing. If you're, yeah, if you're listening yeah. to that mnemonic, uh, that, that might work for you. All right, we'll meet in Taiwan and see if you get them in the field. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been an incredible evening with you. Thank you, Jared, for a, such a, a, you know, a, a real experience of the bird life there, but also of the uh of the scenery and it just so spectacular and dramatic really well, my pleasure and I, i'm sorry my my piece my mac decided to to fall asleep in the middle of the presentation <laughs> well we're glad it woke up <laughs> thanks for covering i, pres I presume you we were covering were you like doing dancing and stuff and <laughs> i was yeah i was gonna tell jim to get out his top hat <laughs> you didn't have to quite get to that point but um no, I think you were experiencing, uh, you could have also just been having some disruption from uh, from the conditions too. Right, yeah. Well, well thanks, great thanks to- everyone for your attention and uh, that was so much fun. Um, wonderful to be with everyone this evening. Thank you for uh, staying with us and looking forward to seeing hopefully many of you at our, our March meeting on the 3rd and Stay warm. Um, if you're, you know, don't be afraid to go outside though. That's my feeling, you know, just, you just want to be prepared, but it's, it's spectacular uh, to go out when it's like this. Be a little bit afraid right now. Maybe. We'll <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Well, some of you, you're allowed. Um, but uh, that was really, really great night. Anything else you want to add, Jim? No, uh, great job, Jared, and and thank you, Janie, uh, for a great job as always. Uh, it's uh, this isn't easy what we're doing here tonight. So uh, I'm impressed at, by how smoothly these things go. Yeah, e e even disruptions notwithstanding, you you recovered nicely, Jared. Yeah, <laughs> you should have seen me running around. It was like a <laughs> so. Thank you all for coming and. Uh, forward to seeing you in March and, and listening to Scott. Great. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a yeah. good night, a good Bye. weekend. Thanks again, Jared. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.